Seriously, bro? You can't tell the difference between technical brutal death metal and brutal technical death metal? Wow, I was right. You are a poser. What's up, everybody? I'm Finn McKenty. This is the Punk Rock NBA, and if there is one thing that rock and metal fans love, it's arguing endlessly about the impossibly tiny differences between sub-sub-sub-genres of rock and metal. And God forbid if the nerds ever catch you applying the wrong genre to a band. How dare you call them pop punk? It gets pretty old, right? So stay tuned for this guide to all the various sub sub genres of rock and metal. So you never have to listen to one of those insufferable nerds again. If you haven't already, please subscribe and turn on notifications so you get all my videos. And also I want to thank NordVPN for sponsoring this video. If you've ever wondered if you need a VPN, the answer is probably yes. Basically what a VPN does is create a secure tunnel through the internet that encrypts all the data you send across that connection. And this is super important for security. Like if you ever use a public Wi-Fi connection at school, a coffee shop, or an airport, there really are people who hang out at those places and sniff your data trying to hack you, and a VPN will help protect you from them. It also allows you to virtually change your location, which means you can access content that's locked in your country. For example, if you wanna watch a Netflix show that's only available in the UK, no problem. Just connect to a UK server and boom, there you go. And as you probably know, there's more and more tracking going on all over the internet and with their CyberSec suite, you will make yourself a lot harder to track. And as a bonus, that also works as an ad blocker. So if you don't want Facebook and Google and YouTube and everyone else tracking you all across the internet, and they've got a special cyber deal. Every purchase of a two-year plan will get you one additional month for free. Just go to the link in the description and use the coupon code PUNKROCKNBA at checkout. All right, so the way I see it, there's essentially three branches of the alternative rock music family tree. You've got punk, metal, and indie. I'll begin with punk because that is where it all started for me. People can debate forever who the first punk band was, and to be honest, I don't really care. But the fact of the matter is that the first band to popularize punk was the Sex Pistols. whose first album came out in 1977 and captured the world's attention by being kind of deliberately raw and shitty and snotty and obnoxious as a reaction to all the soft, polished music of the time like disco and yacht rock. Punk bands like Sex Pistols, Ramones, and The Damned said, fuck that stuff. Let's just play three chord songs as loud and fast as we can and dress like Mad Max characters and piss everybody off which they did. And then things kind of splintered and went in a few different directions, kind of like the factions in GTA or Fallout, which kind of makes me wonder who is the Mr. House of Punk? You've been a busy courier, haven't you? One faction said, okay, it was cool and fun to play like fast, obnoxious, loud shit, but I'm kind of over that. I want to do something slower and moodier, dye my hair black and play something that the cute art school girls can dance to. And that was the birth of the genre known as post-punk. The big names here would be like Joy Division, Gang of Four, among many others. And I personally never really liked this stuff, but I understand what they were going for. I respect it. And there is no denying their impact and influence. If you were an emo kid in high school, then you probably indirectly owe it to these bands. The flip side of that is the other faction who said, what if we just turned everything up to 10 and we tried to play music that was even faster and louder and more aggressive than punk? And that was the birth of hardcore. I'm a fan. In the UK, that would be bands like Discharge, GBH, or the Subhumans. And in America, bands like Black Flag, Circle Jerks, Minor Threat, Dead Kennedys, and MDC, among many, many others. And hardcore is what I really fell in love with starting in about like seventh grade, 1990. And I think its longevity is pretty impressive. That bands like Black Flag are still relevant 40 years after they started, I think says a lot about how important hardcore was. The genre known as anarcho-punk is probably worth a mention here as well. Bands like Crass, Flux of Pink Indians, and Conflict, for example. And this genre, as you might guess from the name, was very political. Government bad, basically, was their message. Kind of cartoonishly simplistic by 2021 standards, I would say. But some of this stuff does hold up. For example, Crass, they were on some very, very advanced shit that honestly, I think is more thoughtful than like 99% of bands coming out to this day. I eventually thought in life, so quite a bit of sea. 
the 25 factors of politics and class. And then there is crust punk, which is basically a heavier version of anarcho punk. And in my personal experience, at least 75% smellier and less intelligent with 90% more alcohol involved. Are you rich? Yeah, I have a ton of money. I mean, I, I, I'm rich too. And we should probably also mention folk punk here, which is basically like anarcho punk, but played on acoustic guitars and washtub basses. Like social calling masturbation, other way it's a solo operation. For example, Defiance Ohio or Days and Days. It sounds a little bit less grating than crust punk, but it is still the same kind of people who have some punk name like Shipwreck and spend their time hopping trains around the country with a malnourished dog on a string named Chaos or something. And my advice is, if you have a functioning sense of smell, avoid this scene. I mean, look at this. You can probably smell this video through your phone. And on the lighter side of things, we have pop punk, which is exactly what you would expect from the name, a poppier take on punk. The earliest examples of this would be like Buzzcocks, Ramones, and Undertones back in like late 70s, early 80s. But in my opinion, the band that really created pop punk as we know it was The Descendants. And the bands that really, really blew it up and popularized it in the mainstream were of course Green Day and The Offspring which eventually led to the version of pop punk that you probably know, which I affectionately refer to as TRL core, because the big bands there like Blink, Sum 41, and New Found Glory were always on that MTV show TRL back in the late 90s and early 2000s, AKA the soundtrack to all those awesome teen movies back then, which involved some hapless loser virgin from the suburbs trying to get laid. And there's also skate punk, which I think of as like a sub 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 genre of pop punk, which is basically a more melodic version of that SoCal hardcore sound created by bands like DI and Bad Religion in the 80s, and then refined and popularized by the Fat Records and Epitaph bands like No Effects, Pennywise, and Lagwagon in the 90s. AKA the stuff that your uncle from Huntington Beach, who still wears Airwalks, Dicky shorts, and black fly sunglasses, listens to in his truck. And speaking of Huntington Beach, there's also ska punk, which was essentially a punky update to what the two-tone ska bands, like the specials, were doing in the 80s. The biggest name here is, of course, No Doubt, like it or not, that's where they came from, and also Mighty Mighty Boss Tones and Real Big Fish. And if you want to know more ska punk bands, just go find the kid with a fedora and a skinny tie that played trombone in his high school jazz band. Another genre that I would include under the larger heading of punk is goth. Artists like The Cure, Bauhaus, Sisters of Mercy, and Susie and the Banshees, for example. And goth is interesting because it's really as much an aesthetic movement as it is a style of music. <laughs> I think of it as the stuff that the girls with black lipstick and teased up black hair that sat in the back of my seventh grade art class listened to, the ones who I secretly crushed on, but I could never admit it because back then, if you were punk, the goths were your enemy. Nowadays, everybody wants the big titty goth GF, but it was not like that back in the day. And to be honest, there's probably a million like sub 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 genres of goth that I just honestly don't even know about because it's really not my area of expertise. I'm basically like your normie cousin when it comes to this stuff. Like anything with dyed black hair and fishnets and vinyl pants is goth to me. So unfortunately, I am pretty useless here. And then there's goth's more like aggressive cousin, industrial. This is another genre where I really can't do it justice because I don't know a ton about it other than the big artists like Skinny Puppy, Front 242, Throbbing Gristle, and obviously Nine Inch Nails. But the defining characteristic here is the use of electronic sounds and instruments rather than the traditional rock band. All that's left is here to remain. But when I think of industrial, there's really one thing that comes to mind, goggles. Actually two things, goggles and buckles. So basically the way that a character from Final Fantasy VIII or a Rob Liefeld comic from the 90s would dress. And also cyber goth people, because I've always been kind of morbidly fascinated with them. They're like IRL versions of Borderlands NPCs. And lastly, under the heading of punk, we have emo which can mean a few things depending on who you ask. If you talk to some old guy with a receding hairline and a collection of Fugazi vinyl, they'll probably give you some version of the real emo copy pasta, 
which defines it as an offshoot of the hardcore scene and emphasizes bands like Rights of Spring and Seisha, who did come from the hardcore scene, but wanted to do something more emotional, I guess, which I don't really understand because isn't all music emotional? Or if you ask 99% of the world, people who do not base their identity around telling other people to stop liking things, they will tell you that emo refers to the 2000s bands like My Chemical Romance, Paramore, Fall Out Boy, Panic at the Disco, and The Used, who are best known for writing dramatic angsty songs for suburban teenagers who wore those like stripey fingerless gloves and used Gerard Way lyrics as their away message on AIM. Now I could keep going literally forever here because there's essentially an infinite number of like sub 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 genres of punk and I'm sure that there's already hundreds of people typing. Wow, I'm shocked there was no mention of insert genre here. But this is a beginner's guide and I think I've covered all the bases so let's move on to metal. I hear the sound in a metal way. All right, so the first leaf on the metal family tree is your basic classic heavy metal. Black Sabbath, Motorhead, Judas Priest, Iron Maiden, and all those other classic metal bands that at this point are so ubiquitous that I almost think of them as like t-shirt graphics from Forever 21 as much as they are bands. Personally, I never really got into this stuff. It was just a little bit too goofy for me and not really heavy enough for me because by the time I heard Iron Maiden, I had already heard like The Accused and Sepultura and also just kind of really not my scene. Like I would associate this stuff with the kids who would skip class to go smoke in the woods behind the portable building at my junior high school, which is just not really my scene. I was into having good grades and being on the debate team. Judas Priest is the best. Uh -huh. Always Calvin has been, always has been. Calvin County, I see. And from there, I think of metal as kind of like an arms race, the same way as countries are always trying to outdo each other with their military. But with metal, it's like all these different subgenres are trying to outdo each other in terms of being faster and louder. And the next step in the metal arms race was speed metal which I was thrown off by because it is definitely not as heavy as it sounds from the name. It's basically just taking like Judas Priest and Iron Maiden and making it a little bit heavier, a little bit faster, but only a little bit. In my opinion, this stuff aged really badly. Like if you listen to a speed metal band now like Exciter, it just kind of sounds like a sarcastic joke. Like I keep expecting Jack Black in a wig to pop out from behind the corner. But I'm kind of on the fence as to whether it's goofier than the next genre we're gonna talk about, hair metal. The big names there you've probably heard of, Motley Crue, Poison, Guns N' Roses, as well as all the millions of smaller bands like Warrant and Trickster and White Lion. And speaking of which, I find it interesting that Guns N' Roses have somehow been retconned as not a hair metal band. Like, they were the hair metal band. Do not believe anybody that tells you otherwise. They were like the definitive Sunset Strip party band. Although that said, I do think their first album, Appetite for Destruction, is an absolute masterpiece. You really need to sit down and listen to it on headphones and give it your full attention to appreciate it. In particular, I would say the guitar arrangements on that album are incredible. Like maybe the best I've ever heard in any genre. It's up there with like Opeth. And there's also a hair metal somewhat nerdier cousin, Shred. For example, artists like Ingwe Malmsteen or the legend Jason Becker. which was basically an entire genre dedicated to people playing guitar as fast as humanly possible. And I think of this stuff as really peaking in the 80s, but actually it's still around. I mean, there's people like Jason Richardson who are just doing an updated version of that, really. But if you want the most over the top, ridiculous, and actually kind of awesome shred band of all time, there is one album to check out by a band called Nitro. The album is OFR, which stands for Out Fucking Rageous, and it delivers. This album is Out Fucking Rageous. Which brings us to thrash metal, which in my opinion is where things start to get interesting with metal. This is where metal actually starts to get heavy and bring in some influences from hardcore and punk. The big names there are obviously Metallica, Megadeth, Slayer, and Anthrax, also known as the big four of thrash metal. But I personally like the German bands the best, like Destruction, Sodom, and Creator, and Sepultura, who are from Brazil but played that style. I'd also suggest checking out Dark Angel and Forced Entry. No, 
And if you can get past a lot of somewhat corny vocals, this stuff is actually pretty sick. I mean, you really can't beat that thrash style of riffing. It still sounds good to this day. This stuff was really big in like the mid to late 80s and it kind of disappeared around like 92 or so when Pantera came along and blew the fuck up and made groove metal the next big thing. But it is still around. I mean, there's actually like a whole other subgenre of current bands who basically cosplay as like wild and crazy 80s thrash party guys. Which brings us to the ultimate conclusion of the metal arms race, death metal, which took thrash to its logical conclusion by making everything as fast and heavy as humanly possible. They turned the skank beats of thrash into blast beats. And if they weren't playing blast beats, they're probably playing like nonstop double bass. The screaming kind of vocals of thrash turned into just straight up growls or sometimes gurgles. The big names here of the 90s explosion of death metal would be Cannibal Corpse, Morbid Angel, Deicide, and Obituary, and of course, Death. Although it is still alive and well, for example, like Amon Amarth is maybe the biggest current death metal band. And there's a million other like sub, sub, sub genres of death metal. For example, one of my personal favorites, progressive death metal, which took things in a little bit more experimental technical direction and added elements from jazz fusion. And I actually still listen to and like a lot of the stuff, for example, like Cynic, Atheist, and Pestilence, or newer bands like Beyond Creation, I think do it really well. And for all you single guys out there, I have good news. If death metal was not a sufficiently effective form of male birth control for you, then progressive death metal should do the trick. It does not get much nerdier than this stuff, and it will help you keep your virginity safe for a very, very long time. It says virginity rocks. Now nah, I got in trouble for it at school. And at this point, things really couldn't get any more brutal. So the natural next step was to take things in the opposite direction, which gave us the genre known as melodic death metal or mellow death, which I think of as almost going back to like Iron Maiden, but putting a death metal twist on it. In Flames and At The Gates would probably be the two biggest names there to check out if that kind of thing is your jam. <laughs> But it's definitely not my jam. Personally, I just really never understood the point of melodic death metal. Like it's almost an oxymoron to me. The entire point of death metal is to be heavy, right? So watering it down with melody makes no sense to me. If I want melodic music, I'm gonna go listen to Miley Cyrus. Is it heavy or is it melodic? Pick one. And of course, we have to talk about the wild world of black metal. If you're watching this, you probably know what black metal is, but just in case you don't, think of it as like lo-fi death metal with a particular focus on like occult satanic kind of themes and the lyrics. Like if you've seen all those goofy pictures of bands in the 90s with the black and white corpse paint, that is black metal. The formative bands there would be like Emperor, Dark Throne, Mayhem, and Immortal, or more recently bands like Watain or Deathspell Omega. And again, there's a million like sub sub genres of black metal, for example, depressive suicidal black metal, which is kind of like if Joy Division or The Cure played especially shitty black metal. There's also war metal bands like Bestial Warlust and all kinds of other stuff that's so goofy, I can hardly say it with a straight face. It's kind of silly, but I get the appeal. I mean, I think we've all had a phase where we went down the black metal rabbit hole because the imagery and stories are so ridiculous that how could you not spend a Thursday night on Reddit reading about all these weirdos with names like Necro Butcher and Hellhammer? Personally, I really can't get into any of that stuff other than some of the more like experimental avant-garde stuff like Abruptum and Have a Hedge. And speaking of goofy, we've also got power metal, which is basically like if you took a Conan fantasy novel and gave it a metal soundtrack. This stuff exudes so much like dorky, socially awkward European energy that I have no idea how anybody can listen to this stuff with a straight face, but you know, different strokes for different folks. 
And now that I think about it, this may be an even more effective method of male birth control than progressive death metal. So guys, if you are saving yourself for marriage, just put on some Hammerfall and trust me, you will be very, very safe. Another big subgenre of metal, which has been around for quite a while, but I think some people maybe still aren't aware of it, is Gent which is a style of progressive metal named after the sound that a very tightly gated downtuned guitar makes when you play a palm mute. And the big artist here would be Meshuggah, who kind of invented the style, and Periphery, who I think popularized the version of it that we know now, and any band with a singular plural noun as their name, such as volumes, monuments, or textures. And last, but certainly not least, we can't forget about nu metal, which was a laughing stock back when it came out in the mid 90s with bands like Korn, Limp Bizkit, and Linkin Park, who were universally hated at the time by everybody in the metal scene, but has actually stood the test of time and now is by far the most popular genre of metal, period, no contest. I guess some things just never go out of style, like dudes with soul patches and puma sneakers, rapping badly over single string bounce riffs, while a DJ scratches and the singer makes aggressive arm movements. And that brings us to the last major branch of the tree, indie. And I don't know, I think I'm just gonna skip a detailed breakdown of this one because honestly, it's just not my thing and I think I'd do a bad job of it. And I really don't feel like writing a thousand words about a genre that I can't stand. But essentially, I look at this as the branch of the tree that's for the artsy kids. Punk is all about saying fuck you to your dad and cops and teachers and whoever else is trying to tell you what to do. So you get a mohawk and you're like, fuck you, dad. You can't tell me what to do. Metal is about like playing guitar really fast and coming up with cool edgy lyrics about demons and shit. And indie is about, I don't know, like having a beard and playing a ukulele and writing songs for car commercials, I guess. I don't know, obviously I don't get indie, it's not my thing, but it definitely is an important part of the scene. So I want to recognize and respect that. Which brings us to the last handful of genres, which are really like combinations of everything I already talked about. For example, when you combine punk and indie, you get a handful of other subgenres, like college rock, which I always make fun of because it's a really dumb, cringy name for basically all the alternative rock bands of the 80s and early 90s that had clear punk influences and sometimes used to be punk bands in the case of like the replacements. For example, Husker Du, Sonic Youth, and R.E.M. And I think of that stuff as basically like diet punk, which is not a bad thing. It just means this is for the people who weren't dysfunctional enough to listen to Black Flag. Like if you're a little bit fucked up, but not that fucked up. Or Midwest emo, which you can think of as regular emo, but with clean guitar and less eyeliner and more people that wear glasses. Classic artists there would be like the Promise Ring and Sunny Day Real Estate. and math rock, which is kind of like Midwest emo, but with even less hooks and more twinkly, weedly, weedly riffs. For example, like Don Caballero or Chan. And bonus points, this genre is also a highly effective method of male birth control. I think basically the more notes per song, the safer your virginity will be. And the combination of punk and metal creates another set of subgenres. For example, crossover, which is what happened when hardcore bands started listening to a lot of thrash metal and became what my friend Bruce Reeves calls choppaholics because their riffs all go choppa, 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 choppa. Bands like DRI, SOD, or mid-period Agnostic Front, for example. And grindcore, which was the even more extreme example of that. This is when punk kids back in the 80s were like, hey, what if we just played as fast as humanly possible at all times? Which they did, and it ended up sounding like super sloppy borderline noise. And they were like, yes, perfect. That is exactly what we were going for. For example, Napalm Death, Early Carcass, Pig Destroyer, or my personal favorites, Insect Warfare. And of course, Metalcore, which is basically like the continuation of crossover, starting with bands like Killswitch Engage and God Forbid, who said, hey, wouldn't it be cool if As I Lay Dying had breakdowns? 
and the current generation of metalcore like Architects or Bring Me the Horizon who said, hey, wouldn't it be cool if Linkin Park had breakdowns? And then Deathcore came along, which is basically bands like Suicide Silence, Whitechapel, and Chelsea Grin, who said, hey, wouldn't it be cool if Cannibal Corpse had breakdowns? And the answer to that question is yes, it was cool. All right, well, I've gone on long enough. I could keep going on for literally hours because as I'm sure people in the comments will mention, there are dozens and dozens of artists and genres that I left out, but I think this covers the basics. Before I let you go, I wanted to mention a couple things. Number one, my merch, like this brutal technical death metal and technical brutal death metal shirt, or this MySpace deathcore inspired shirt complete with an edgy slogan in impact font, just like all your favorite merch from back in the day. I also have my pop punk with breakdown shirt and this neon cartoon monster shirt straight out of 2009. You can get all of those at the link in the description. And as always, I wanna thank everybody who supports us on Patreon, especially those of you who support at the true cult level or above. Patrons get every one of my podcasts a week early. There's a members only private discord server that I'm in all the time. I do giveaways and Q and A's. There's also a way to have me review your music or video or artwork or anything else you might want me to look at or listen to. You can join that at the link in the description as well. And with that, I'm gonna sign off for now, but I will see you next time.